It's February. Winter has hit full stride and the grind of a long season marches on. The Spartans have a tough end to their schedule, with six of their last nine games being played away from East Lansing. The Big Ten Conference is home to cold climates and even colder welcomes. Hostile arenas full of fans that hope to see you fall await around every corner. With a target on their backs all year, the Spartans have been getting every opponent's best shot. A visit to Iowa means another tough matchup and another must win if the Spartans hope to keep pace. Michigan State is on the road in Iowa City, Iowa. Well, on the surface, you might say, well, Michigan State's 22 and 3, ranked fourth in all the land. Uh, Hawkeyes, one game under 500, only 3 and 9 in Big Ten play. Well, I'll also point to this emotion is a big thing, and everybody would like to have a piece of Michigan State. Uh, again, it's uh, Michigan State's fifth game in 12 days. Some of that fatigue may be catching up to the Spartans as, uh, as they get ready for tonight's game. It's up and controlled by Michigan State. So Jackson wins a tip, flips it over there to the point guard, catches Winston. As MSU lobs that door, slam! Jackson, 2 0 Michigan State. There you go, run the floor. Nick Ward! Right in the face of Bear. Now to Daly, shot clock at 2, he'll force a 3. <laughs> How many times have we seen that? It's having trouble. Now to Bridges. Drives the baseline. Bumps into a Hawkeye. Banks it off the rim. It is good. And he was fouled. Over to Bridges in the wing. McQuaid for a three. He got it. Matt McQuaid is money from that spot. Garza puts it on the floor. Garza didn't travel. Somehow got the shot to go in. Well, the Iowa finishes strong here. And at the break, it's 48 to 42, Michigan State. Bridges attacks down the lane, scoops it up and wow. in. That was a nice game by Bridges. On a give and go, Moss having all kinds of trouble, but somehow quickly covers a bad situation, gets it and slams it home, and we're tied at 60. Langford makes a move, step back, jump shot from the side. That was sweet. Gut check time for Michigan State with 8.20 left. Bridges, Bridges making a move. He gets it now to Goins for a three. Off the rim. Yes! It nice bounce. Everywhere. It went in. Kenny Goins of all people gets a three, and MSU's up by one. It's going to be a steal right there. Saw it Bridges coming. saw it coming, and nobody else did. Wow, what a play by Bridges. He set it up. Bear, two seconds from midcourt for the top. Michigan State escapes again. What a what, game. What a game. Well, I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. Growing up, I played a few sports. You know, early in my elementary years, I played a little bit of soccer, a little bit of basketball, football. And, you know, then I kind of, you know, veered off to basketball because this was something I really loved. I've grown with a, a great family. I'm, I have, I'm blessed to have both of my parents in my house as well as a younger sister. And you know, it's just been the best, best for me because I have a really, really great support system within my family. Since I can remember, I always had a basketball in my hand. And when I was born, my dad was going to UNA. Um, that's a D2 college, University of North Alabama. He was going to UNA and when I was born, um, the whole basketball team was there. And each player on the basketball team, they took me and held me and passed me down. So like, I've always been around basketball. But my mom, you know, she went to UNA, then she ended up going to Muscle Shoals Community College. But she was the one that was really good. My dad would tell you that, you know, I didn't get none of my skills from him. Um, I just kind of got my will. But my skills, you know, the way I play, um, more or less from my mom. Basketball was the last one I introduced to him because I kind of knew how I was going to be about him in basketball. So I let him play soccer first for a long time, and then he wanted to play baseball. And he, he was really good at baseball. But once he started playing, he, he just, it was just too slow for him. He was, he played in the dirt more than he did anything else. Football, he was a great athlete. He was a quarterback, he did really well. And then by the time he was seven or eight years old, I finally let him play basketball and he was just begging me. And he wasn't that good. 
like he was horrible. I remember his first game. My wife and I both played in college and I was thinking, is this our son? And then one day my dad, you know, he kind of looked at me and said, do you want to be good at this? And I told him, I said, yes, sir, I want to be good. I'm tired of sitting on the bench. And, you know, after that, we kind of just put it in countless hours in the gym. Just, you know, ever since I could remember that day, from then on all the way to, you know, now, he, he instilled that worth ethic in me to just always, you know, if you're not good at something, always, you know, give 120% to get better at it. And if you don't get better at it, you still can look yourself in the mirror and say that you, you know, you gave it your all in. And that's kind of how that started with the work ethic that I have now. Joshua's father was called to Iraq for work, causing him to be away from his family for six months. Little did Joshua know that the characteristics his dad taught him on the court would soon prove pivotal to his survival. It's Alabama and, you know, especially when it's football season, it's really hot. And it was around the time we were doing two a days, you know, we out in the hot sun, this golden sun, you know, for, for however long we out there and it's just, we going hard. And so, you know, I, I came home just real exhausted and I was like, okay, um, well, maybe I'm just too, just, maybe I'm just tired. You know, it's not nothing too big. And then as, as time went on, um, it got really hard for me to, you know, to sleep at night. Um, I started having um, migraines and, you know, I was hallucinating. And, you know, I began to get like a, a high fever. I think it got to like 103 or 104. I tried to call home one day. I couldn't reach anybody for like two or three days. I couldn't call my mom and get in touch with her. You know, none of my family members. And, and I just thought maybe it was the time zone thing at first. And after about three days, I was just starting to get a little, you know, a little worried about it. And then finally, my wife got the Red Cross to contact me and let me know that you know, something was wrong with Joshua. And I can remember the time going to the hospital, I cried the whole ride because I was just scared, you know, what was gonna happen to me because I didn't, that never happened to me before. So on top of, you know, me, you know, going through this and being without my dad, there was somebody who was really a strong code, you know, in our family. I, it was hard for us to deal with that. And that was for the first time that I can remember in my life that I felt like I had no control. And I didn't want to miss out on a decision or some information that, you know, that could just mean his life. Doctors struggled to make a diagnosis as Joshua's health continued to decline. Thankfully, his grandmother suggested testing for bacterial meningitis, the same disease that took the life of Joshua's uncle three years to the day he was born. To lose somebody, you know, from that and then have me going through that was kind of hard for me and as well as my family. And, you know, just to see my mom at night, you know, crying a lot, and, you know, really not knowing, you know, what's going on. She was praying a lot and you know, I was like questioning God, like, am I going to die, God? Like, is this, you know, the last, is this it for me? You know, at 12 years old, and I, I didn't know, you know, whether I was going to be able to live throughout the next day or not. And so, you know, I just heard God's voice tell me that, you know, you're not, you're not gonna die. You know, I have a plan for you, I have a purpose for you. During the hardest times, Joshua was surrounded by the support of his family. However, what was missing was the person he needed most. I think during that time, I wasn't there. My brother, my mom, um, I have a cousin that's, we're really close, like brothers. And he, he was there and I talked to him and I just asked him, you know, how, you know, how bad is it? And he told me that, uh, man, ain't he? He, <clears throat> he told me that, you know, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't do me any good to come. You just need to pray. And you need to pray earnestly right now. And um, so I knew with my cousin and my brother being there um, that they would take care of him as if I was there. My dad, you know, the things that he kind of instilled in me, you know, before he left, you know, I kind of reached back on and just, and always thought about what he used to tell me, you know, be positive, you know. If you if you be positive and, 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 believe, and think positively, positive things will come. I feel like I'm the person that brings a lot of the joy to the family. And so part of the reason why I was fighting was that I, I know I had other people that, that were really dependent on me. It wasn't really just about myself. 
Faith and family helped Josh overcome his near-death experience. As he began the road to recovery, doctors said he would never play sports again. But Josh had other plans. I actually came back stronger, if you, was, if you could say, you know, from being sick, stronger mentally and physically, because my perspective on life changed completely. Um, I, I understood that, you know, even though I was 12 years old, I understood that life could be taken from me just like that. You know, after that year, everything took off for me. I went undefeated in middle school. When I played middle school basketball, I became a McDonald's All-American. I was able to achieve a lot of things that, you know, that, you know, I didn't really think about achieving. Through his hard work and belief that everything happens for a reason, Joshua's determination awarded him a scholarship to Michigan State University. God really just told me that, you know, this is where I needed to be. And then on top of that, you know, Coach Is is a Hall of Fame coach. He's a great guy. Um, he's an unbelievable guy, unbelievable person. And the coaching staff here, you know, they're unbelievable people as well, but they also are the best in the country. You know, this is a blue blood school. It just felt right for me. I didn't take no other official visits. Michigan State was my only official visit. You know, once I came back from my official here, you know, I called Coach and I told him I wanted to come here. I wanted to be a Michigan State Spartan. We got a real close family, and that's one of the reasons why you know, I, th I felt like Joshua chose Mi Michigan State because of the, the family's atmosphere of the basketball programs. That's a lot like our family. Langford with wow. the reverse. What a play. Josh Langford inside. Josh is Winston. The kick in the corner. Langford for three. A jump shot from the side up and in by Josh Langford. There's that mid-range game. You know, with the things I try to bring to the table is just to do the small things, but also as well as just play how I play, but also, you know, play within the, within the, my role. And, you know, I just try to just do the best I can for the team, you know, rebound and defend and run the floor and, you know, score when I, when I can score, when, when, it's, when it's time's present for me to score and just try to be a leader as well. His mom and dad are unbelievable people and uh, he's really been raised uh, properly. And then he gets here and he, hooks up with those guys that he's hooked up with, and it's it's like a bond of brothers that I've never seen anything like. One from the Bahamas, one from Flint, one from Alabama, you know. What's the common denominator? The common denominator is a love for the game and a respect for people, and uh, I think they've done an incredible job, and every Spartan should appreciate who and what they are. Let me see, let me see you get a bucket. from going up as a boy in Huntsville all the way to now, is that in order for me to be successful, I have to follow God's plan. But true success is not in what the world says and what you know we may think is money, cars, and you know making it into the NBA and different things. But true success is fulfilling God's plan. My life is a book. I feel like I can write a book on my life, but everybody, everybody's life is a book. Everybody's life is a bestseller. Spartan basketball is what it is today because of Judd Heathcote. On February 10th, Michigan State held a Judd Heathcote tribute night throughout the game versus the Purdue Boilermakers. The following is the Judd Heathcote memorial video that was viewed during halftime. George Melvin Heathcote was born in North Dakota and moved to the state of Washington at age three. After serving in the U.S. Navy, Judd would attend Washington State University, where he played both basketball and baseball. After earning his degree in mathematics, he began a 14-year stint as a high school teacher and coach. He would also meet and eventually marry his best friend, Beth. They would have three children. In 1964, he made his way into the collegiate coaching ranks with an assistant's job at Washington State with his friend and mentor, Marv Harshman. Then came a head coaching job at the University of Montana, where his Grizzlies came within two points of upsetting the mighty UCLA Bruins of coach Johnny Wooden in the NCAA tournament. In 1976, then MSU Athletic Director Joe Kearney would hire Heathcote to take the reins of the basketball program in East Lansing, Michigan. It took just three years for the Spartans of Judd to gain national prominence. 
as he coached Magic Johnson, Greg Kelser and company to the national championship. The title game versus Indiana State and Larry Bird would cement the excitement of a Final Four forever. Gregory Kelser of Michigan State has won his first NCAA championship in history, defeating Indiana State 75 to 64. The telecast from Salt Lake City still holds the record for the highest rating for a college game in TV history. Judd would coach the Spartans for 19 years, retiring in 1995. During that span, he would deliver 340 victories for MSU, three Big Ten titles, and nine NCAA appearances, and one national championship. He was twice named Big Ten Coach of the Year, would later be enshrined in 10 Halls of Fame. Heathcote coached seven All-Americans, 22 players that made their way into the NBA, plus three of his players became head coaches in the NBA. He gave MSU the reputation of point guard university as he tutored the likes of Sam Vincent, Sean Respert, Scott Skiles, Steve Smith, and Irvin Johnson. Magic would remember the Heathcote rant, EJ, be a guard, not a garbage. Judd valued the job of being a coach and he had respect for the game he loved. He tried to always do things the right way. He was tough, but he was fair, and he was funny. Judd coached for 13 years in the venerable old Jenison Fieldhouse, and he always said, they'll never build a new Fieldhouse in my lifetime. He would suffer a heart attack in the 1980s, from which he would recover. Soon after, the school's board of trustees gave the okay to build a new home for Spartan basketball, the Jack Breslin Student Events Center. And Heathcote would quip, yeah, I had to fake death for them to agree to build a new arena. Judd also had the insight and knowledge to mold outstanding assistant coaches and would bring about the eventual hiring of his successor little-known assistant from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan named Tom Izzo. The two coaches will eternally be connected. We celebrate the legacy of a legend. He was a true Spartan and an absolute icon, Judd Heathcote. game of the week, all right? That's all everybody's talking about because it is the biggest game of the week. So your focus got to be there, your energy's got to be there, it's got to be at an elite level because you're playing in a championship setting. Yeah, man, win on three, one, two, three, win! Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And welcome to the Breslin Center. We've been circling this date for quite a while, February the 10th. The one meeting between what I believe are the two best teams in the Big Ten and maybe two of the best teams in all the land. It's Michigan State and it's Purdue. This no doubt is a championship event and to be a champion you got to play like one. You got to play through things that go wrong and you just got to find a way. We've been looking forward to this sonic blockbuster all week long. Number three Purdue, number four Michigan State. Look at the size advantage. Hassan wow. Schilling, the jump hook, smoothly done. Tough to stop him one on one. By Cassius Winston. He's trying to get some advantage in transition. He leans oh. in, used the screen. Bridges with authority. That's what a star player does. That's what a superstar does. He has got to attack. Cassius Winston lobs it to Schilling. Nice play. The Spartans have woken up after a slow start. Yeah, they really have. And I think the momentum started with the dunk. Big shot from Carson Edwards. He makes big shots. It's Winston with three seconds to go. Drives the lane. Nice drive. Plays it in. Nice drive. Way to go with a little momentum now. That gives you a little Uncle Mo on your side. If they're to win Michigan State, they will not win this game unless Bridges is an absolute PT peer in the second half. You're not seeing many transition layups. Winston buries a triple. That's a big one. That's a momentum builder. 
And he didn't stop. The Uso wants to explode. Every time they seem to make a run, the dude comes up with a big play. And there he is, one on one. And he converts again. He's got that nice little jump hook. McQuaid with daylight. Yes! Nice little ball screen. McQuaid used it really well. He's made three big threes in this game. Carson Edwards through traffic, able to get it to go. This game tied for only the second time. Michael Michigan Schuette. State has yet to lead. There. Bridges straight away. Got it. You kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you? Oh, I love it. Look at the end zone. They're jumping with joy. Goins buries the jumper to tie it again. Nice play by Goins. They needed that play off the bench. Now they need a defensive stop. If you know where they're going to go. Deep with the jump hook this time, and he's short. Good job defensively. The best player on the floor for either team ought to be Miles Bridges. Absolutely. We'll see if that is where Michigan State goes. Bridges has it. Time. Five seconds to go. Bridges for three. Yes! Oh, oh! The big star delivers. The big star delivers. And that's what you want out of a big star. Michigan State survives at home. The game-winning three by Miles Bridges. They've won eight in a row. And they take down number three.